Is this, there we go. All right, welcome. Thanks for coming to our talk. Um, applying open source methods to building and training large language models. I, we're all here at AI Dev. I think open source, AI, sound like pretty popular topics. So I think you'll like what we have to say. So we've got 30 minutes, quite a few slides. So I think what we're going to do is try to get through them. We want to give you a certain amount of developer depth but uh, we'll have to go kind of faster than them, so I'm gonna ask that you hold your questions. We'll take them at the end if we have time, but we're also going to be very available at the Red Hat booth um, while we're here. So first, a quick introduction. This is me, this is my blob of text. Uh, in putting this together, I realized I've been doing open source for 10 years. I was a little surprised. Things seem to move a lot faster now than they used to, so that's a lot of time on open source. Um, but Primarily, in addition to a lot of time on open source, I've been working on a lot of AI since 2017. Uh, our current project is a very recent thing. Large language models are very recent, but uh, this is my focus. Uh, and certainly, uh, I'm in IBM research, but open tech is what I focus on. And if you need to get a hold of me, I'm not too hard to find as Markster. And I'll let you introduce yourself, Carol. Thanks, Mark. Hi, I'm Carol, and I'm from Red Hat. And uh, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be at this talk with Mark. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, usually when I do a self-intro, I talk about what I've been doing recently. But I would actually like to go back more than 20 years ago. Uh, in university, I was actually taking AI courses on machine learning and expert systems. But that was as far as my AI knowledge went. Because after that, I got hired by Nokia. And uh, which brought me to Finland, it's where I'm based now, and I was more on the, you know, the uh, consumer and uh, software development side for a while instead of research. And I joined a startup called Yola, also based in Finland, and then I ended in Red Hat in 2016. Um, more, you know, enterprise software and um, community management stuff. And I only joined this Instruct Lab project two months ago, so after like a 20-year you know, hiatus, I'm back to learning more about AI myself. So I'm here to learn as much as you are. Um, some of you are, I, I'm sure a lot of you are also experts already. So um, I'll, I'll let Mark do the heavy lifting in this talk. But if you want to reach me, you can uh, find me on some of these uh, Mastodon X. I'm not so active on X compared to previously, but still. And also if you want to chat, uh, I'm on Matrix, the uh, cross-platform chat network. I like your change log better than my log <laughs> of text. No, I, I think uh, I just wanted to be short, but I, maybe I wasn't that, that effective. Anyway, um, some of you, you know, we, we start with like a um, kind of the state of the union type of thing. What, what is happening now with the rise of AI? And as you know, recently, um, I think it was in April, Llama 3 model, a, you know, pretty uh, relatively open model was released, and within a few weeks, uh, I believe it was like three weeks, um, more than 6,000 forks was, uh, appeared on Hugging Face. So it represents a good, how to say, a pro progression and, and direction for open AI, open models, but it also creates a problem. So maybe we can look more into this, and how, how do we end up in this place and what we can do about it. So let's set the landscape a little bit. So I have been playing with AI quite a bit, I think since 2017, but really like two years ago, I didn't know what large language models, foundation models, or even like what's a hugging face. It's, you know. So things have changed a lot. So where we are today is foundation models and large language models are huge and are affecting all of us every day, right? So. A very important part of that, though, is while we're building on these foundation models, you would like the model to be expert in your area, whether you're a vendor, you're a customer, you have an industry focus. How do you make these large language models that you want to leverage work in your space? If you can align a large language model to be good at your use case, that's golden, right? That's what we're trying to get to. But before we get there, 
Um, in speaking of hugging face, like just two months ago, I learned about hugging face, and I was like, why is everybody in AI so interested in that cute little emoji, which is hugging face? But right. <laughs> um, but as, uh, as we are here in AI Dev um, and Linux Foundation event, I think most of us know the uh, open source way of working on things, on projects, development, co collaboration. So if we compare how that um, methodology works for a lot of these open source projects versus the current kind of um, contribution model towards these large language models, that's really not a, a very similar kind of um, process or way of doing that. Open source projects, there's usually like a well-defined uh, release cadence. There are like um, feature roadmaps that you can take a look at what's going on, what's coming in the future. You can have incremental contributions and so on. Whereas for most of the LLMs out there, um, they are only released at certain intervals because we know that it takes a lot of resource to kind of generate and train these models and then there's also, even if the model itself is open, in the, in the sense that you can use it openly, but we don't have a lot of visibility to what goes into the models. And also, if we want to contribute as a community towards it, there's no easy way to do that. So how do we overcome some of these problems and uh, make it a bit more like, accessible and um, dem democratize that for more people in the community? So I think if we look at today, even with an open source model, if you have a large language model and everybody needs to fine tune it and build it and come up with their own, you end up with, you know, instead of one llama, now there are many llamas. And all of these took a very large amount of power to build, a lot of money, a lot of carbon. Um, and what do you end up with? You end up with all these models. It's kind of like everyone's forking everything. So why can't we get to one big community model that everybody works on in open source where it's not so many forks? So imagine we have a process like this. Kind of like open source code. You start out, you're playing with the code, you're experimenting, but in this case, you, you want to add skills and knowledge to large language models. Let them understand what you want them to understand where they're currently lacking today. Once you have that working, you want to contribute it back to the community. That's great. Let's share it. So you do a con contribution to a project, like a PR in open source. What happens when you do a PR in open source? Does it just get merged overnight? No. <laughs> Never does, right? There are re reviewers, there are maintainers that have to go and decide whether that's worthy, whether it's safe, whether it's valuable. So they'll look at a PR, and hopefully they will approve it and merge it for you. Then what happens? The project gets released. But I'm not talking about open source code right now. This is what we can do with AI models. Add knowledge to a model, contribute knowledge to a model, have triagers merge that into the base of knowledge. And this periodic release, now your model is updated on a regular basis, a model that used to not understand your space or has some missing knowledge. The next version comes up, all of a sudden it's a smarter Smarter model. So these large language models seem to know everything. They don't. You can make them smarter. And guess what? We just keep going. Just keep going, keep going. All right. So we have the pleasure uh, to introduce Instruct Lab here to address some of the challenges that we, we've mentioned, um, we've outlined just now in the previous slides. So the lab part of Instruct Lab, LAB, stands for Large Scale Alignment for Chatbots. It's a methodology developed by IBM Research. Um, the foundation, mo foundation model team in IBM Research. And it consists of three main parts. The first is the taxonomy-driven data curation. What this means is that um, it groups sk skills and knowledge in a very uh, comprehensive way of representing them in a taxonomy tree. and this makes it very accessible for people to contribute, so you know exactly what, what you're contributing to. And also, it provides a systematic way to identif identify gaps in the data. So you're not just dumping a bunch of data, you know what kind of data is being input into the, um, you're trying to add to the model to be trained. So um, it's a very systematic way of doing that. 
The second part is the large-scale synthetic data generation. And this um, can gen generate, uh, if you input uh, just like five to 10 information pieces, you can generate synthetic data to train the model because you need a lot of volume to create that kind of um, uh, quality data to help with that. And there's also um, a phase during the SDG, synthetic data generation, that uh, you know, like it, it doesn't just throw everything in, it will check that if it's a good quality data before it, it accepts that. So there's checks and balances within the process. Oops, sorry. <laughs> and the next phase is the next um, section is the phased large scale alignment tuning. So it includes both skills and knowledge tuning. And we'll get, get a, a little bit into the details of what each of that means. And also the LAB lab. Um, which explains why we have a little puppy as the mascot, Labrador puppy. So just a little um, kind of uh, tidbit for that. And I think, uh, Mark, please explain some of these de in detail for us. Sure. Uh, Carol covered quite a bit of this. This is you know, another more detailed look, but I think a couple of important points um, that you should have just caught is one, the taxonomy helps categorize this knowledge and these skills that we're feeding into it. So there's a taxonomy. A lot of this is built on synthetic data generation. That's how it really becomes uh, enough data to train a model when you start with uh, just a little bit of human contribution. But the most important thing I wanted to bring out as we're looking at this slide and going across generating data, validating it, you know, building a model, is it's a teacher-student relationship going on here. So we're using a teacher model to train a student model. And weird thing, like, I, I come from a family of teachers. My parents were teachers. My sister's a teacher. All the friends are teachers. I didn't quite make the cut there. But <laughs> weirdest thing, I didn't know until I had this project. The teacher-student relationship, it works better when the teacher knows the answers. I, I never knew that. I thought you could just make stuff up and, you know. So what we do is we, the teacher model will take some human contribution and it's generating really good synthetic data and a lot of it. And if you have enough good data, you can train a model. So the student is learning from the teacher. So taxonomy, synthetic data generation, validate, build, grow. And, and in this one is the, the look here that we wanted to show to bring this in. If you look at all those little squares, what that's representing is sometimes we build skills, sometimes we add knowledge, we'll get into that. But you see all these little blocks. Imagine there's a whole community. Everyone's contributing more knowledge. Everyone's contributing more skills. This is like crowdsourcing. But you take all those things, put them all together, and now we're building a model with this whole new layer of knowledge, whole new layer of skills. But all those contributions come together and are merged into a large language model. All right, so a little bit more about what uh, skills and knowledges are. Uh, you can think of knowledge as something you typically find in a textbook. So something that's um, more or less factual, uh, with like either dates or uh, important uh, facts that you learn from the teacher in school. And st skills are something that you learn you can apply and generate something um, based on the knowledge that you have. So skill, a compos compositional skill could be something like um, re repeat the slides uh, in, the, in the matter of how, how, how Yoda speaks, for example. So if I'm you know, talking normally, but you want a Yoda version of it, you can, that's a skill that you can train the model to do. Then there's the foundational or core skills, which are things like math, how to add and subtract, um, uh, chain of thought reasoning to arrive at a conclusion, and also coding is a comp uh, core skill. And then we have some examples here. So if you are given a prompt, generate a numbered table with every state in New England, its capital, and what year it became a state. So the knowledge are things like, what is New England? What are the capital? What's the ca what are the capitals? Are there more than one? <laughs> and uh, what is the capital? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody England. know yes, the capital of New England? 
<laughs> Several, five, was it five states? I, I don't live in the US anymore, I don't know. <laughs> Let's ju we'll, just, we'll just say Boston. Okay, okay. yeah, Boston. <laughs> what are the capitals and when, when they are founded? And the skill is based on this knowledge, how do you generate that numbered table and uh, you know, what do you put in a column and row and so on and so forth. So because we're talking about this community contributed model, we also want to avoid certain type of uh, topics that we don't want to be fed into this model. Things like topics that may include violence or even self-harm, um, company or trade secrets. I mean, sure, you can make your own model with your own data, but you know, we are talking about things that can be uh, contributed back to the model in public. And also, we, we don't want the model to have uh, strong biases and discrimination, so any kind of discriminatory data, we don't want to include that. And even medical or financial advice. Facts, yes, but not advice. Like, oh, if you are coughing, go you know, eat this or drink that. Don't, don't include that kind of data. But otherwise, um, useful skills and knowledge are more than welcome to be contributed. So what would it look like to contribute your knowledge or teach a skill to a large language model. Well, here's a quick look. The way we're doing it right now, what you would do is you would simply submit a YAML file. And uh, we're requiring like five example questions and answers. So the simplest one uh, would be simpler than the picture here, by the way, would just be five Q and A's in a Q and A.yaml file. And that's what you would submit. So it's very simple. But basically with knowledge and skills, the skill submission is being focused on here. So in addition to the questions and answers, I also provide an example because I wanted to point out that context can ground that. So this, instead of just a simple question and answer that you're trying to teach it, you're saying, given this context, if I ask this question, here's the answer. And this is a great example where the context shows a variety of different uh, markdown tables. The question and answer says, Given that, here's, if I ask this question, you know, which breed has the most energy? It doesn't even say of dog, and it gives an answer based on reading that table. Uh, without the context, you could say which breed of dog has the most answer and provide an answer. Uh, a model could learn from that. But here the model is actually learning how to read a table. So you provide these, this Q&A with context questions and answers, and then the synthetic data will be generated so instead of five examples, you'll have thousands. And we can build a model that can read a table. In this next one, it, it went a little long because uh, in the previous slide it mentioned attribution. See at the bottom there's attribution because we want to make sure when we're contributing knowledge that we're including the proper licensing and attribution for where that came from. So we're requiring that when people provide knowledge, they're saying where it came from, who owns it, what's the copyright information, et cetera. So that's an attribution.txt file at the bottom. But up at the top is an example where this is how you contribute knowledge. So knowledge here, instead of like how to read a table to get facts out, this is where we're actually contributing knowledge that includes the facts. And what's not so obvious, you get the questions and answers, that's probably pretty visible to you. But if you look at the part where the document is, so that's a Git repo, specific revision, and a file. So we'll go out and we'll pull that from Git because we want the knowledge to be sourced somewhere. So that document will be pulled in and the model will then have that knowledge. And the question and answer part, similar to the context earlier, it's questions and answers about that knowledge. And if we just provide some examples of questions and answers, synthetic data will be able to generate even more question and answers about that document. Think of it, what if the document was, say, insurance policies and, uh, or, or, or workforce policies, HR policies, and you need to read all this stuff and understand it and ask questions about it? Well, we can automate a lot of that. So you don't have to write all the questions and answers. We'll synthetically generate them, and we can still learn from that and build a model that now has this knowledge and also like from the prior example, has skills to know what to do with it. So after you have um, come up with some skills and knowledge that you might want to uh, contribute to the model, how, how do you quickly try it out, test it, give it a sanity check? So Instruct Lab provides a local experimentation, which you can run on uh, your laptop. 
And uh, currently, it's a command line interface. Uh, and you can run a few commands that um, Mark will later go through, ex some examples of how you generate the uh, synthetic data, as well as do a, a local training on your laptop. There's also a back backend process, which is the end-to-end -end, uh, LAB lab uh, technique that, that will you know, do the proper training and everything. But um, the main thing is there's something that you can quickly and easily um, do on your laptop. I just got a MacBook last week. I, I've always been a Linux user, and I got up and running. I had more, uh, how to say, I, I found it easier to get up and running with I, uh, Instruct Lab than figuring out the weird key combinations on the MacBook because I'm not a Mac user. So it's really very easy to get up and running and try things out with Instruct Lab. Oh, uh, sorry, I, I just want to point out, and at the end, you get a base model version N plus one, which is contributing to the base model and not just another fork, which is important. So, so one thing, I, I don't know if you mentioned earlier, we mentioned the Labrador puppy, <laughs> but uh, language alignment for chatbots, the, yeah. the B is for bots. So we'll, uh, we'll show you a link later with the paper. Um, but the Instruct Lab CLI, I, I work on the CLI, and one thing that's very important, I mentioned in this you know, ideal world, you can experiment and contribute. Well, CLI is a way for developers to experiment, something that's easy to run. So it makes it easy to download models. So we have quantized models, so I run them on my MacBook using the GPU, the, the metal GPU that's on my MacBook. So I can serve a model locally, I can experiment with it, I can chat with it, so I can experiment with new skills and recipes, I can even train it on my laptop to see if it worked. So that's the idea of having a local experiment uh, sandbox for developers. And what the CLI looks like, um, just an example here. So we created this iLab CLI for Instruct Lab. So it's very easy on, a, on your laptop. You say iLab chat, and you're just chatting with a model. Why would you do that? You want to see what it answers as is. Maybe it already knows the answers. But when, when it's lacking, so you start to see what it can, what it does not do, then you want to do this Q&A.yaml in your taxonomy. So iLab diff is a simple command. It says, okay, we have a taxonomy, but there's this new file, like a, like a git diff. All right, so there's a new contribution. And then you, you'll say, okay, let's do an iLab generate. iLab generate, basically it's using that diff saying, I'm going to focus on this new file, this new knowledge, this new skill, and I'm going to do synthetic data generation based on that. And this again, I can run it on my laptop with this quantized model. So it'll, it'll loop through, iterate a little bit, little bit using the GPU and take your provided examples and create the synthetic, synthetically generated examples of Q&A. And, um, and then you can train on your model as well. And the great thing here, again, we, we built it like on MacBooks, you, MacBooks using the GPU. It's, it's pretty slow with the CPU, but you can run it on your laptop. Obviously, we're working very closely with Red Hat. A lot of people are bringing their Linux skills to this, containerization skills, et cetera. So we'll work more on making it run everywhere, but it definitely helps if you have a, a GPU. And quantization makes it run locally. Now, if you look at the back end, it's a little more complicated. I say it's a simple little quantized model you can run on your laptop. But the reality is this is a large language model. To build the full scale thing, you, you don't just need one little GPU on your laptop. You, you, you want hundreds. So there is a back end then. Once this taxonomy is approved and it looks good and it's, and it's been, you know, you've done your experimentation, you contribute it, it'll go to a back end where it's going to generate, you know, thousands instead of tens. So the synthetic generation happens, but also it gets evaluated, right? We want to generate it and evaluate it, and then generate the skills, evaluate the skills, do checkpoints, test them, see if they're done, keep iterating, more checkpoints, more epochs. So the back end is more the heavy duty thing. I don't know if you know what Vela is. That's one of those IBM things. It's like, let's put a big computer with a lot of GPUs and a lot of power, train a thing on the back end. Um, so this is what the, the official backend would do to spit out that final model. And you know, I'm from open source, open tech, so I'm hoping 
this is more open in the future, but we're still kind of working through some of the open sourcing, open open sourcing of, of the <laughs> right. of, of the back end part. Sorry. So if we go back to the original thing I, I I posed, like what if we could apply open source practices to large language models, like submitting code, getting it approved, getting it merged, doing a release? Well, we take a look at this today. So we gave you the CLI. You can run a model on your laptop. You can experiment. You can chat with it. You can train it. You can chat with the new model right there using the iLab CLI. Then you take that, just that one YAML file. You don't contribute all the synthetic data. It's just a simple YAML file that says, here was my example. It looked like a pretty good thing. Let's submit that. The triagers will look at it, make sure it's got the attribution, make sure it's not one of those things we, we don't want to train a model, right? Large language models scrape the internet. There's all kinds of misinformation, filth, just plain wrong facts. Well, we don't want to let that happen with the community. So there is this human level of uh, inspecting that I'm sure will be more and more automated in the future. But once it gets through and says, this looks good, the community wants this to be part of the model. It gets merged and periodic releases will happen. So what you contribute to that knowledge will show up in the next version on Hugging Face. And then we just keep, keep going around and round and round. So this community built large language model will just keep getting smarter thanks to the contributions of the community. So um, you're right, we do have the link to the paper for the large-scale alignment for chatbots uh, on slide 10. We have the slides uploaded to our talk uh, on, on shared.com, so you can check them there. Um, so let's talk about how you can get involved in the project, because you know we want all of you to join and contribute and provide feedback and so on. So this is the best part. Now that we can crowdsource this tuning process, that's where you come in and participate. So these are the three main uh, repos in our uh, GitHub org. The github.com slash instruct lab is the main GitHub org. And underneath, um, you have the community repo, which has um, you know, how, how, how to get involved, which uh, channels to join, what, what mailing list to subscribe to, and so on. The taxonomy repo is where you contribute the skills and knowledge that we talked about. And the instruct lab, instruct lab repo is the uh, cur current, the, the command line interface, the main way of interacting with uh, the model on, on the command line. So these are the three main GitHub repos, but you can just go to the main org, uh, github.com slash instruct lab for all the different uh, repos that, that are available there to take a look. And to be, you know, because with any new projects, you may have questions, you may not know uh, where to look for people and answers. So again, these are the channels that we are communicating on currently. Join us on Slack, uh, the mailing list, like I mentioned, and we have regular project meetings, um, taxonomy triage, community meetings, CLI meeting, as you see, it corresponds to the three main repos that I just mentioned, and also weekly office hours. So you know, different formats of participating, chatting, or talking to us in, in well, video call face-to-face. -face. Or um, social media, X, Mastodon, LinkedIn, YouTube. And on YouTube, we have some, uh, we have recordings of the meetings. We also have uh, some examples on how to run Instruct Lab on the different platforms that we just mentioned. How, how many do I have time? Okay. We're doing great on time. Okay, so um, that's one on Go getting up and running on the MacBook, which I use to get my MacBook up and running. That's one on using Linux. If you have, you have a Linux box with, for example, NVIDIA GPU, you can do that. And that's one on running it on Windows using the uh, Windows sub, sub WSL. <laughs> I'm getting nervous because I, we only have one minute left. So anyway. 60 seconds. So <laughs> if you just scan the QR code, it co uh, connects you to the collaboration page we have, which has most of this information. So um, that, I think that's the last slide. Really. Yeah, and I, and I feel like I, I know I just pointed out the back end might not be all open source right now because you know, I get hung up on that. But I, I hope we made it clear this is an open source project. It's not just the talk was a lot about the open source way of building large language models. So I know we got that in there. But yes. Instruct Lab is an open source project. So we have the open source community, the open meetings, and uh, the I open think that's code. That's my earring. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> yes, so uh, please, if you have any questions at all, uh, come look for us at the Red Hat booth. It's really the Instruct Lab booth. <laughs> and uh, come, uh, you know, see us. Uh, get, get cute little doggy stickers and um, chat with us about open source and AI. Thank you very much. Thank you.